Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Edson Gastaldo, and I'm here to present Dr. Wendy Leeds Hurwitz, our guest for the 100 Years of Irving Goffman seminar series. And we are very pleased to bring her here to speak to us. Uh, Wendy Leeds Hurwitz is Professor Emerita of Communications at the University of Wisconsin in the USA. She's currently the director of the Center for Intercultural Dialogue, and she has plenty of works uh, relating communication theory and the works of Irving Goffman. Uh, among her books, there are, uh, we can quote, semiotics and communication, social approaches to communication, and Irving Goffman, a critical introduction to media and communication theory, co-authored with Yves Wankan, that was once invited to, to be here presented at, at this uh, seminar series. We are very much pleased to have Professor Leeds Hurwitz with us, and I invite you to give your speech. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to read the presentation, even though I don't usually do that, as a way of making it simpler. And I am hearing myself 30 seconds after I speak, and I need some technical help because I won't be able to do a presentation. We're going to take a break for a moment while we try to work on the technical aspects. I'm sorry, folks. They're working on it. Okay, this is a test. Let's see if it's gotten better. I remember a psychology experiment when I was an undergraduate where they did this to us on purpose, made us listen to ourselves 30 seconds later. And it was a good way to prove how people can't talk if you do that. No. Let me close my other browser. Let's see if that was the problem. I don't think it was. But let's try that. Okay, let's try again now. Okay, that seems to have been the problem. My apologies, that was my doing. So now let's go ahead and begin. What I was starting to say is that I'm going to be reading this. I don't usually do that during presentations, but I need to do that here because of the translator. It's not going to be fair to someone to try to translate what I've got if the words aren't accessible. The title of my talk is a little longer than the one on the poster. 
It's Goffman's Invisible College at the University of Pennsylvania. In the 40 years since his death, sociologist Irving Goffman has gained a reputation as something of a loner, but in much the same way that Yves Wanka has examined the assumption that he rarely traveled and proved that to be incorrect, this myth requires some investigation. At least some of the explanation for his reputation is likely an artifact of simply not having access to his papers. So researchers haven't been able to see his correspondence with friends and colleagues. However, others have donated their papers to various archives. And so it's possible to recreate at least a few of his connections with colleagues and show him to have been, in fact, far from a loner. This is the basic outline of what I'll be presenting. There's an intro, there's Goffman at Penn, which needs to start with Goffman at Berkeley. I'll introduce the key actors, the peripheral group members, the projects, and the conclusion. And this was the slide I was just talking about, about him being a loner. So let's move on. A distinction is sometimes drawn between insider and outsider histories. In this case, I am an insider, but at the periphery. My focus will be on Goffman's informal network at the University of Pennsylvania, always called Penn by those of us affiliated with it, where I was a graduate student in residence from 1975 to 79, thus during his time there. And I knew many of the people to be described here as my professors and my supervisors. I also had a strong connection to one of the four projects that I'll examine in detail and a weak connection to another. As a result, I'm probably a good person to document what was happening around Goffman at Penn during his years there. So let me tell you what I know and what I've been able to learn from archival or published documents, as well as from correspondence with others who were there at the time. It will likely change the common sentiment about Goffman being a loner. A brief note on the images used in the PowerPoint. These are photos that I found on the internet and wanted to use to help you gain a sense of the various participants. I make no claim to copyright ownership and I cannot give anyone else the right to duplicate them. Irving Goffman from 1922 to 82 was a sociologist based in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania from 1968 until his death in 1982. He had particularly strong ties with colleagues in several other departments there and uncommonly weak ties with peers in his own discipline of sociology. Now, an invisible college typically refers to connections between scholars most often within the same discipline, but based at different universities, so their ties are not obvious to outsiders. In his analysis of, in her analysis of invisible colleges, Crane references Coser's insight that despite popular myth to the contrary, most intellectuals cannot produce their work in solitude, but need to give intellect, uh, excuse me, need to give the give and take of debate and discussion with their peers in order to develop their ideas. Not all intellectuals are gregarious, but most of them need to test their own ideas in exchange with those they deem their equals. So the question becomes, who did Goffman deem his equals? His community of like-minded scholars. The answer will take up the first part of this discussion. By naming Goffman's connections at Penn an invisible college, I intend to turn the concept on its side. He had multiple strong connections to scholars in the same university, but in different disciplines and departments than his own, and thus they have often been overlooked. To those who assume connections within a discipline are the norm, those made across disciplinary boundaries are unexpected, unlooked for thus invisible. The fact that he spent little time with peers in sociology for most of his years at Penn 
should not be understood to mean that he did not collaborate with professional colleagues. In fact, as will be demonstrated today, he was involved in multiple specific concrete projects with overlapping sets of colleagues at Penn. But these were interdisciplinary rather than based within sociology, either in terms of topic or structure. My focus here will be on Goffman's interactions at Penn with Del Himes, who was originally based in anthropology, John Schwed, who was in folklore, William Lebeau in linguistics, and Ray Bergwissel and Sol Worth, who were both in communication. In terms of specific joint activities, I will describe four projects. The Center for Urban Ethnography, the Conduct and Communication book series, and two journals, Language and Society, and Studies in the Anthropology of Visual Communication. The story of Goffman's experience at Penn actually begins at the University of California, Berkeley, where he worked with Hans. Goffman was there from 1958 to 1968 in sociology. Hines, from 1960 to 1965, was a joint appointment in linguistics and anthropology, so they overlapped for five years. They were both part of an informal gathering, sometimes called the Saturday Group, including John Gumpers, Susan Irvin Tripp, and Wallace Chafe in linguistics, John Searle and David Schneider in philosophy, uh, Ethel Albert in anthropology, Dan Slobin in psychology, Alan Dundees in folklore, and Aaron Sikorel in sociology. This was a loose confederation of colleagues, primarily organized by Gumpers. The suggestion that together they could build a comparable interdisciplinary group at Penn was part of how Hines convinced Goffman to move. This is a quote. I believe that we are gradually building up an informal constellation of people with related interests and affinities that is approaching a sort of critical mass where there just would be a large enough group who understand the point of what you're doing and what the rest of us are doing. The place isn't perfect but it has great possibilities. And I believe you would find it a good place for yourself. And I want very much for you to come. This was in a letter sent to Goffman a few months before he signed the contract. Specific colleagues mentioned as part of the potential group were Ward Goodenough and William Davenport in anthropology, Kenneth Goldstein in folklore, Saul Worth in communication, and Bill LaBeouf, who was then in New York, but joined Penn shortly after. Bird Whistle arrived the year after Goffman, so was not mentioned as an enticement, although he was already based in the same city, Philadelphia, teaching at Temple University, a fact that Goffman certainly knew. It's important to note that even from the beginning, the goal was to bring together a group of people sharing common research interests despite belonging administratively to different departments. When Goffman got to Penn, his initial appointment was as Benjamin Franklin Professor of Anthropology and Sociology, and his office was always in the University Museum. Although the sociology department was not especially welcoming, lots of faculty members in other departments were delighted to have Goffman around. Now, let's look at Penn. First, in order is a review of the major scholars at Penn with whom Goffman did, in fact, end up working on a variety of projects. Evidently, what he did at Penn was look for those who not only had overlapping research interests, but who also were good scholars because they all either were very well known or became so later. One thing all the network members had in common was the extent to which they held secondary appointments across departments representing their interdisciplinary interests. This included Goffman, who was granted a secondary appointment in psychology as of 1977. 
since his primary appointment already included two disciplines that made three for him. Penn has always highlighted the interdisciplinary nature of the campus and the faculty, and secondary appointments are one way to illustrate this. Members of this group supported one another's academic interests and in the process created strong ties. Goffman was obviously involved in all four of the projects to be discussed. Del Hines earned a PhD in linguistic anthropology at Indiana University in 1955, where he formally studied linguistics, anthropology, and folklore. He first took a position at Harvard and then at Berkeley, moving to anthropology at Penn in 1965. He was formally based in multiple departments at Penn over the years. Becoming unhappy with colleagues in anthropology, he moved to folklore in 1972. In addition, he held formal affiliations with linguistics, sociology, and communication. As if this were not enough in the way of interdisciplinary connections, he took on the role of being Dean of the Graduate School of Education in 1975, a position he kept until he moved to the University of Virginia in 1987. Hines acknowledged Goffman in multiple publications and was involved in all four of the projects to be described today. William LaBeouf, a sociologist best known for his study of linguistic variation, earned his PhD at Columbia University in 1964. He arrived at Penn after Goffman, but they knew each other early, and he was one of those Hines named as a draw for Goffman. LeBeau served first as a fellow at the Center for Urban Ethnography before accepting a full-time position in linguistics at Penn in 1971. He had secondary appointments in psychology and in education. He thanked Goffman explicitly in his book, Sociolinguistic Patterns, saying the original impetus to put these studies together into a single volume and organize them into a single coherent framework came from Irving Goffman, whose help and encouragement is acknowledged with many thanks. Goffman thanks Lebov for suggestions in several publications, and Lebov was included in three of the four projects discussed here. John Schwed was hired in folklore at Penn in 1969, this year after Goffman arrived. He was given a secondary appointment in education. He had earned a PhD in sociology and anthropology at Ohio State University in 1965, where he also studied linguistics and folklore. After initially taking a position at Lehigh University in social relations, he moved to anthropology at Temple University. When he left Penn in 1982, it was a return to anthropology, this time at Yale University. He was already citing Goffman before either of them moved to Penn and acknowledged Goffman's influence on his writing after they both arrived. His story is essential to the Center for Urban Ethnography, but he was not involved with any of the other projects. Ray Birdwhistle, like Goffman, earned his PhD at the University of Chicago, but in anthropology and a few years earlier, in 1951. He had been Goffman's professor at the University of Toronto in 43 to 45, and they stayed in touch despite his moves to the University of Louisville, University of Buffalo, and then Temple University, where he was based in both anthropology, and psychiatry, while simultaneously serving as senior research scientist at the Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute. Bert Whistle was a participant in the Macy Conferences on Group Processes, along with Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead, and many others. He arranged for Goffman to participate in the third of these conferences in 1956, where Goffman spoke about interpersonal persuasion. Once based at Penn, Goffman helped convince Birdwhistle to move from Temple to Penn. Goffman only occasionally mentions Birdwhistle in print 
But when he did, it was to give substantial credit. This is a quote. Persons like Ray Birdwhistle and Edward Hall have built a bridge from speaking to social conduct. And once you cross the bridge, you become too busy to turn back. Birdwhistle has explained in print that the book he's best known for, Kinesics and Context, would not have appeared if it had not been envisaged by Irvin Goffman. In addition to having that book published in the Conduct and Communication series, Birdwhistle was affiliated with studies in the anthropology of visual communication. Saul Worth, a photographer and filmmaker, was Birdwhistle's colleague in communication. He was hired before Birdwhistle in 1964, remaining until his untimely death in 1977. Like most of the others, he held a secondary appointment. His was in education. He was the founding editor of the journal Studies in the Anthropology of Visual Communication. He was also one of the contributors to a volume resulting from a Center for Urban Ethnography conference. So he presumably was a participant in that event. He served as a member of the editorial supervisory board of the University of Pennsylvania Press, so distantly connected to the communication, uh, Conduct and Communication book series. But in addition, Worth appeared in that series posthumously. Larry Gross organized his papers into a book. Thus, he was associated with three of the four projects. In addition to these key actors, there were a number of peripheral group members who were connected in various ways to Goffman. Anthony Wallace was born in Canada, like Goffman. He earned a PhD in anthropology from Penn in 1950 and was affiliated with the Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute, as Bird Whistle was, but earlier, from 1955 to 1960. He simultaneously held a visiting position in anthropology at Penn until he became full-time professor and chair in 1961. Most importantly, he was the department chair at the time Goffman was hired. So he was the one who had the single most important critical voice in whether or not that would even happen. Wallace had previously published a review of Goffman's book, Asylums, making it clear that he'd read not just that book, but the body of work well before hiring the author. Given that he concluded Goffman's essays are worth reading by any anthropologist, it should come as no surprise that Wallace was happy to offer Goffman an organizational home in anthropology. Ward Goodenough and William Davenport were additional senior faculty in anthropology who Heinz mentioned as likely colleagues for Goffman. Goodenough earned a PhD in anthropology at Yale in 1949 and began teaching part-time at Penn the same year, full-time in 1951. He also clearly appreciated Goffman's work before Goffman's arrival, citing several, several works by him in a 1965 chapter. Davenport also earned a PhD in anthropology from Yale. It, his was in 1956. He held a dual position at Penn in anthropology and the Museum of Anthropology as a curator. All three of these and all, uh, all three of these anthropologists had the potential to become part of the network that I'm going to describe, but in fact, they didn't. Despite this, all three are critical to the story simply for the fact of welcoming Goffman to their department. Given that he was coming from a sociology department to, uh, with a sociology PhD, this was not an obvious choice. And of course, if they had not welcomed him, he never would have moved from Berkeley to Penn. John Fought was based in linguistics at Penn from 1967 until his retirement in 1995, with secondary appointments in anthropology and education. He frequently shows up just outside the inner circle as a committee member for dissertations on which Goffman also served, for example, 
and Falk wrote a review of Goffman's relations in public for the journal Language in Society, where in addition to praising the book as one in a series of extraordinary significance and promise, that's a direct quote, he explains the way in which Goffman's work overlaps with the concerns of Heinz and LaBeouf, scholars whose work would undoubtedly be known to and appreciated by readers of that journal. In turn, Goffman acknowledged Fought's helpful comments in some of his own publications. Fought was not on the editorial board of Language and Society, but he did write a lot of book reviews for that journal, seven in addition to the one on Goffman's work. Henry Glassy, the last photo on this slide, earned a PhD from Penn in folklore in 1969, initially taking a position at Indiana University, returning as a faculty member in folklore at Penn in 1976. He knew John Schwedwell, they had published a book together, and that may be how he met Goffman. Glassy and Goffman much later created a business card, although so far as I know, they didn't actually establish the antiques business it represented. They just enjoyed going antiquing together. They even traveled together to England in the summer of 1982. Goffman did eventually connect at more than a superficial level with at least some members of the sociology department at Penn. Most critically, Renee Fox with a PhD in sociology from Radcliffe College in 1954 who took a position in the department in 1969, becoming chair in 1972. As she's explained, among my early acts in the office of chairperson was to give Irving voting rights in the sociology department, which he didn't have, and to involve him in departmental affairs to the extent that I could. Fox recounts a longer explanation of Goffman's integration into the department saying he became a really good citizen in the sociology department who helped me in various things I tried to do as a chairman, most especially in the recruitment of new faculty members. He almost always came to their presentations, agreed to accompany those of us who took the candidates out to dinner and the like. At least one of those new faculty members was Elijah Anderson, whose photo is also Obviously, there were many other faculty members at Penn in these years, and a surprising number show up as part of a relevant discussion. Occasionally, they are acknowledged and thanked in Goffman's publications, such as Teresa LaBeouf, who was Bill LaBeouf's first wife. She took a position in sociology after Goffman had arrived. She doesn't have a photo here because I've been unable to locate one so far. Um, others had their work cited, such as Virginia Himes, who was Delheim's wife. She had a position in folklore and linguistics, a joint position. Or Gillian Sankoff in linguistics. Um, Goffman and Sankoff married, and then much later, LeBeau and Sankoff married. But first, she was a professor at Penn. Others who were part of the extended network throughout the 70s, but whose connections are less visible in publicly accessible documentation include Kenneth Goldstein and Dan Benamos in folklore, who welcomed Schwed Himes and the center to that department, Barbara Kirsch and Black Gimblet in folklore, who published a book in the Conduct and Communication series, and Eli Anderson in sociology, who I've already mentioned. The points to remember are that Goffman clearly developed strong ties to others at Penn and that these were productive connections in terms of leading to research results. It's time now to describe those. Clearly, as Himes had promised, he and Goffman were able to develop a viable community of peers evident not only from the comments about connections made to this point, but in four joint projects, the Center for Urban Ethnography, the book series Conduct and Communication, and the journals Language in Society and Studies in the Anthropology of Visual Communication. All of these were about research, 
The center provided funding to support training a new generation of researchers and particular types of research conducted by already accredited scholars, while the two journals in the book series provided publication outlets. The Center for Urban Ethnography was established in 1969 through a $1 million grant from the National Institute of Mental Health. The initial grant was made to Schwed, Goffman, and Himes. Schwed served as the official director until 1974 when the funding ran out, although Goffman and Himes are often listed as co-directors. Schwed has given us a few more details about Goffman's role. Irving Goffman, this is all a quote, Irving Goffman had just arrived in town from Berkeley to assume a chair in anthropology and sociology at the University of Pennsylvania and told me he was looking for something to do. We met over corned beef in a South Philadelphia deli and in a few minutes had worked out a plan to form the Center for Urban Ethnography at Penn. Within a week, the administration of the University of Pennsylvania bought the idea. The Department of Anthropology chose not to get involved, however, with at least one of its faculty members accusing us of discriminating against white students. It was instead the program in Folklore and Folklife that welcomed the center to Penn and asked me to teach in their unit. And with Goffman, Delheims, and myself as co-directors, we recruited a talented group of young researchers and opened an office in the fall, end quote. Goffman supports this description in a letter to Del Himes, who was out of the country at that point, saying, quote, the grant looks like it is almost in, and that is because John and I have worked so hard. Tomorrow morning when you shave, look at yourself and try to feel guilty. The center followed directly in the tradition of the Chicago School, designed to take the best trained pre-doctoral students ready to undertake dissertation that we could find, this is a direct quote, and to help guide and focus their interests and put them into the urban field following the ethnographic approach, end quote. The center distributed numerous small grants as a way to shift focus and attention to new topics. In addition to studies of racial and ethnic groups, there were studies of those who came into contact with these groups, such as the police, and more generally of public places and the public order. Best known of the publications are major works by Goffman, Himes, LeBove, and Schwed, as well as shorter pieces by Gail Jefferson, John Rickford, and Dennis Tedlock. The variety of activities supported by the center included support for dissertation research and writing, support for conference papers and panels, and entire conferences, and for publications of all sorts, occasionally appointing fellows, as already described in the case of above. Communication and Conduct is a book series that Goffman and Hines co-edited for the University of Pennsylvania Press. This began in 1970 and continued even after Goffman's death when Sankoff and Glassy took his place. And so from 1983 to 1990, they worked with Himes as co-editors. The list of only those books published between 1970 and 1982, thus under Goffman's supervision, follows. They were all carefully chosen and all of them had been frequently purchased and cited and have influenced later work in significant ways. So Goffman's Strategic Interaction was the first book out in 1970. Bird Whistles, Kinesics, and Context followed later that year. LaBeouf's Language in the Inner City and Sociolinguistic Patterns both came out in 1972. Del Himes, Foundations and Sociolinguistics came out in 1974. Barbara Kirsch and Black Gimblet's Speech Plights, an edited collection, came out in 1976. 
Gillian Sankoff's The Social Life of Language came out in 1980. Goffman's Forms of Talk came out in 1981. Worth's book that was edited by Gross, Studying Visual Communication, came out also in 1981. Del Himes' In Vain, I Tried to Tell You came out in 1982. And Steve Feld's Sound and Sentiment was the last one published in 1982. Goffman took quite seriously the mandate he and Heinz had established that in order to be included, books must address both language and society rather than either one or the other. Heinz says that in the two years before his death, Goffman worried that the series might have exhausted its purpose because the manuscripts coming to attention were strongest inattention to speech genres and text and were not balanced by manuscripts strong in social structure. Goffman clearly took on at least some of the administrative work of the series, including writing the hard letters rejecting proposals. Joel Scherzer, a Penn PhD in anthropology from 1968, who thus preceded Goffman at Penn, he worked under Hans, submitted a manuscript to be considered for the series, to which Goffman responded, on, and this is a quote, on behalf of Dell and myself, I inquired of Robert Irwin, the editor of the University of Pennsylvania Press, about the possibility of the Indian language book. Apparently, the cost would run about $7,000, and Irwin feels that if $5,000 could be raised, there might be a possibility. We buried scholarship, praised the wage that the laboring man was getting these days, and I said goodbye. I think it's a good idea to give general courses to undergraduates, but dissertation writers ought to be trained in something practical like screenplays, TV scripts, and grant proposal writing. And this is a letter from Goffman to Scherzer in 1974. It was copied to Heinz, which is why there's a copy made public. The book in question was most likely Scherzer's dissertation. Later, it was published in 1976. They clearly knew each other before this interaction, given that Scherzer expressed gratitude for Goffman's critique of his 1973 article published in Language and Society. That connection was reaffirmed by the way Goffman's letter closes. He said, you are boobs, party poopers, etc." for not going to Mexico City. Love to the great French chef. And this was presumably a way to ensure that the friendship would continue beyond the rejection of the book proposal. A more successful proposal was one by Gillian Sankoff for the social life of language. This was actually put forward by Goffman to Robert Irwin, director of the press, with the comment, Sankoff won't be long in these parts. And I hope we can tie the thing down with the decision quickly. Of course, Sankoff did, in fact, stay both in the city and in Penn. There was a connection between the center and the book series, aside from the fact that Goffman and Himes were part of both, which is that researchers or research projects funded by the former were at times published by the latter. And you might notice where it says CUE under some of these books. Both books published by Heinz, both books published by Goffman were listed as having been supported by the center. LeBove was a fellow at the center, first receiving funding for time spent writing and then receiving two book series, uh, two book contracts with the series. Dennis Tedlock was a center grant recipient for one project and then had a book contract for another. And Dan Rose received funding from the center and then was later published in the series. That's not listed here because it was a book that came out after Goffman had died and was no longer involved. All right, let's move on to the second project. In addition to the book series with Goffman, Himes established a new journal called Language in Society in 1972, and he served as editor until 1992. LeBeau served as associate editor, and Goffman served on the editorial board from 1974 until his death. 
the journal was included in the list of center activities for several years. In addition to his editorial role, Goffman also published in the journal, specifically replies and responses, later reprinted in forms of talk. Looking at other key actors, Himes published editorials and an enormous number of book reviews. LeBove published several articles in the journal, and Falk published the review of a book of Goffman's, as well as other reviews, as I've previously noted. Himes has published some of the correspondence with Goffman about articles submitted to Language and Society, and he donated other letters where they're now available at the American Philosophical Society archives. Goffman's comments can be described as incisive, blunt, occasionally even cutting. For example, this is a quote, in brief, and to put it partially, author's name is blocked out by Heinz, mimics a tradition he doesn't quite understand with work he hasn't quite done. But they were always carefully worded as when Goffman argued against minimal text for analysis, saying, after all, to ask us to focus on such a small strip when there is no way for us to know the biography of the occasion and its participants is to imply that magical unpacking is going to occur, but it doesn't. End quote. So far as I can find that wonderful phrase, the biography of the occasion, does not even show up in Goffman's publications, but it's perfectly clear. The critical facts about Goffman's time on the editorial board then are that he often reviewed submissions and that he took the time to write quite lengthy and considered responses, complete with incisive comments that read like some of his publications. But Language and Society was not the only journal of pen with which Goffman was involved. Studies in the Anthropology of Visual Communication was established in 1974 under the auspices of the Society for the Study of Visual Communication. This developed out of the American Anthropological Association's program in ethnographic film. Worth served as both president of the society and founding editor of the journal. Goffman's involvement with this journal was shorter than with Language and Society, but nonetheless important. For his book, Gender Advertisements, was first published as a monograph in, the, in this journal, Sabaton. Worth's introduction does a nice job of setting it in context, clearly demonstrating his familiarity with it. In the acknowledgments for the version published as a book, Goffman thanks work. He said, I'm very grateful for its then editor, uh, it, the journal Salvacons, then editor, the late Saul Worth, for support in working out the original edition and for permission to use its plates and glosses. And goes on to quote Worth. In addition to Goffman, Birdwistle and Feld also published in the journal during Worth's editorship. When Worth died suddenly in 1977, Larry Gross at Penn and Jay Ruby at Temple, which is based in the same city, Philadelphia, took over as editors of the journal. A few years later, 1980 to 82, Goffman joined as a consulting editor when the journal was reestablished under the name Studies in Visual Communication. Along with Glassy and Davenport, Fell served on the editorial board. Oops, sorry about that. I got off sequence. Those are all the people I was just naming. All right, conclusion. During the 60, late 60s and 1970s at the University of Pennsylvania, Goffman was surrounded by a group of uncommonly bright, creative, and productive peers interested in collaboration with him. I've provided brief introductions to those peers with whom he worked most closely at Penn and the stories of how an overlapping group of 
colleagues established a research center, a book series, and two new journals. Goffman's peer group in these activities are still the scholars we are reading 50 years later, and they have been widely recognized for their work through multiple major national awards. Goffman himself receiving such recognition from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Those of us who were present at Penn for any of these projects, who took courses or otherwise connected with any of these professors, understood well how fantastic our experiences were. And once we moved on to other universities, discovered just how unique our context at Penn had been. Because they had been part of an uncommonly interesting and active group at, of colleagues at Berkeley, Goffman and Hines set out to deliberately create another such network at Penn, and they succeeded to an astonishing extent. Goffman clearly was an active player in those of the group's endeavors described, despite the fact that his role as colleague or team player is hardly what he's known for today. In fact, quite the opposite. My suggestion here is not that everyone who's reported other types of interactions has been wrong. Rather, I've tried to expand our understanding to include a series of positive, proactive interactions with colleagues. Overall, taking multiple stories into account should always permit a more complex and complete understanding of what happened in the past. It is interdisciplinarity that serves as the heart of the story of Goffman's Invisible College at Penn. The faculty members described in these pages were willing to ask questions beyond the obvious topics in the disciplines in which they had been trained or into which they had been hired. The lesson of this story for other scholars and other universities are simple. It is completely reasonable to look to colleagues with shared interests across departmental and disciplinary boundaries and support one another in research endeavors. And in fact, doing so may result in particularly strong ties as the needs of a research topic take priority over disciplinary politics. Goffman looked across disciplinary boundaries for the best and the brightest to be a part of the network he helped to construct. He participated fully, whether that meant notifying a potential work author that their work could not be accepted for publication or helping to design a research center to obtain a major grant. And the lesson of this story for disciplinary historians is also clear. Do not accept what everyone says. Instead, search for relevant documentation. In the end, it turns out that Goffman was anything but the loner of popular perception. Now, at the end, I've got photo sources. I'll leave these up for a minute in case people wanted to look at them. I rather doubt you do, but just in case. These are where I took the photographs that I've used in the slides. And since this will be available as a video on YouTube, I don't need to spend very much time on each of them. You'll be able to stop the video and take a look. Most of these came from university pages. Ah, okay. <laughs> Let me just get the last one up there. Thank you. All right, that should do it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wendy, for this wonderful uh, lecture. I'm uh, very happy to be here to, to talk to you. Uh, congratulations. Oh, gosh. I can't see you at all. Oh, uh, 
Okay, hold on a second. You're frozen. Okay. Yay. Are we back? Okay, you froze. Okay. Am I back on yours? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So we can talk now. Okay. okay. Oh, let's praise the Lord that internet, <laughs> uh, internet connection is going on. Okay. Uh, in Brazil, uh, I would like to make you a question. That uh, in Brazil, the kind of communication studied by Goffman and his uh, invisible college, mm -hmm. that's a, a nice expression, uh, had been labeled or named as uh, social linguistics or sometimes interactional social linguistics. They are set the studies on the area of letters and uh, they are studied along with uh, foreign language teaching and literature studies and this while communication studies study a very different thing that would be best named like um, media studies or you see so uh, interpersonal communication situations like uh, intercultural exchange face to face situations is a mm -hmm. sort of phenomena that is the interaction order phenomena that are hardly addressed by conventional sciences there's still a field uh, to to be uh, made to be constructed through research and publications and uh, I would like you to comment this, uh, this theoretical gap in uh, contemporary communication studies. Uh, right. Where's Goffman on communication <laughs> studies? <laughs> well, at least within North America, both the US and Canada, I know, um, there is a part of communication that's usually called either interpersonal communication or language and social interaction. When it's divided, interpersonal communication is typically more quantitative in terms of methodology. So people set up experiments, put people together, and then analyze what they found. And language and social interaction is typically more qualitative. So it's more about studying what happens when people get together and talk who would have been doing this without your experiment. So you go into an existing, you do more ethnographic research, you go into an existing context. And so if you put them together and say it's just the study of what people do when they're together as part of communication, then Goffman would have fit there. If you keep them apart, then Goffman would be much more often studied by people who say they are in the language and social interaction research area. But I don't think Goffman cared a whole lot about what people called the research topic they were studying. And I think the fact that he had such strong interdisciplinary ties is really good evidence of that. He didn't care if you called yourself a sociologist. He cared whether you were studying what happened when people interacted together naturally. So in the US and Canada, people who are studying communication often do study media as they apparently do in Brazil, but that's not the only thing they study. There's also, for, and it's also not just studying interaction or studying media. There are people who study intercultural communication. So who look at what happens when people from different cultural backgrounds interact. Sometimes they look at that in terms of media. So they might be looking to see what happens when a television show from one country is shown in another country or a film from one country is shown in another. Sometimes they look just at what happens when people from different cultures are interacting together. I think Goffman would have been fine with whatever we call it, as long as we still pay attention to the topics that he considered important. And I, in communication in the U.S., in the book on Goffman that I wrote with Yves Weikamp, 
we discovered that Goffman's work has been used by people in pretty much every topic within communication. So for example, his work on stigma is widely used still by people who study what's usually called health communication. And many, many of his books are used by people from different approaches who then ignore all the rest of his work, which is something that absolutely fascinates me. I actually at one point wrote up a very short blog for Oxford University Press at their request on Goffman and how people were now taking his concept of frame analysis so for granted that they don't even bother citing him anymore. They've taken the idea over and across the last 40 years, they have just gotten to the point, and I actually followed it through in that piece. Um, it's called Who Remembers Goffman? So if anybody wants to find it, look, Oxford University, I, just, I guess it's just Oxford University Press blog, something like that. And then Who Remembers Goffman? You should get to it. But I follow through all the times where people in the early days when they used frame analysis as part of media studies would cite Goffman. And then later they cited the people who cited Goffman and then later they don't bother. Goffman is gone. They've just completely left him out. He's taken for granted. And in some ways I concluded that that's a good thing because it shows that his ideas were so central that we have simply taken them as obvious today. However, they were not obvious originally. And I do realize, by the way, that Goffman took the notion of frame from Gregory Bateson, and he absolutely credited Bateson with that. Uh, I don't think, well, Bateson, in fact, also took it from Lyle, so it wasn't, I don't want to go through the whole long history. So I don't know if that answers your question. People in many parts of the discipline of communication as I know it, study Goffman. What I find fascinating is the extent to which they only learn a little tiny piece of what Goffman did because that's the piece that's relevant. And it's always surprising to me that some people don't find it necessary to go and look what else this man wrote. Because I would do that. If I found something really good, I would go, you know, what else did this guy write? Let's go read that. And so they don't do that. They find one piece and cite it over and over and over. And quite often will do very interesting, detailed, in-depth analysis based on something very, very little that they found in one of Goffman's works. So he is still enormously provocative across many different topics of study not just in communication, not just in sociology, but across multiple disciplines. It is absolutely astonishing if you ever go and look up, for example, on Google Scholar, how many citations they are to any of his books, because his books are his major publications rather than most of his articles. And so you just go look them up and go look at all of those thousands and tens of thousands of people who wanted to be citing it. Everybody should be happy to get that kind of uptake of their work. I think that everybody would just be thrilled. I'm sure he would. Yes, definitely. And uh, I, I've seen that when I studied in Manchester uh, at mm -hmm. the Manchester University Library. It's a giant uh, university with several buildings. And mm -hmm. Goffman's book, I, I uh, scanned the library uh, after Goffman's, each of Goffman's books. So uh, they are spread all over the, the libraries. They are not on sociology because gender advertisements are setting on business studies. <laughs> not to mention it's, women's Because studies. it's about advertisements. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, presentation of self is set on, on social psychology. Yes. And, you see, uh, forms of talk is social linguistics. So yes. it's spread all over the, the, the if you, you go for the, the uh, the journals where he published, it's the same. He, he published widely in law studies and in several uh, different areas. Uh, 
and uh, th this is uh, fantastic uh, because uh, it's amazing to me that uh, you ended your your speech talking that Goffman is sometimes called a loner that definitely he's not <laughs> but uh, he has this this uh, fame of being a lone ranger let, let's say but uh, the fact is that he left no descendants there there are uh, not a, a follower of Goffman that say oh this is Goffman's heir his uh, heritage is spread the same uh, way his books are spread over the library his heritage yes. is, is spread over several fields but there's no new Goffman this, no, this is uh, like uh, one would say uh, Jacques Alain Miller to, to Jacques Lacan I don't is, think he uh, wanted why? an heir in that sense. I don't think he considered that appropriate. He was unique in so many ways, and I think he was quite happy to leave it at that. I don't think he felt the need to train someone to follow in his footsteps. He wanted people to do their own interesting work, to take what he said and what others said and go off and do something new and different of all of their own. So he was on a number of dissertation committees, but those students have all written about him. So it's not like we don't know whose committees he was on, but there's a difference between the way he worked with students and the way some other people have worked with students. You're absolutely correct that there is no disciple. There is no one or two or three or even five people who he trained up to be the inheritors of his project. That was not the idea. It was all about sharing ideas broadly and getting many people to pay some attention. And he was very successful in that. And I imagine he would be happy with that result. Obviously, we can't go and ask him now. It's a pity. Fantastic. But if I, and, uh, if I go back to your original question about how he's said to do applied sociolinguistics or interactional sociolinguistics in Brazil, I don't think he would object to those terms. All of the comments for the journal Language and Society, for example, were explicitly about the need to study both how people talked and communicated more generally and the larger social context. And so I think he'd be fine with those terms. I don't think he would have an objection. And did you meet him personally? I never met him. I had several interactions with him without having met him in person. Isn't that odd? Um, I was a student there when he was there. And in the book that I did, and the title is Irving Goffman, so it's easy to find, the book that I did with Ivan Khan, I included a lengthy extract, almost the entire letter. He, well, let me go back a step. I wrote a paper for a course with Del Himes, my first semester in graduate school. And Del liked it and sent it without my knowledge to Irving Goffman. Irving Goffman sent back a letter about what I had done in my paper. And the paper was about naming conventions. It was about having work for somebody where she needed to do a variety of uncommon things in order to refer to some of the other people in the office. It's long and complicated, but that's all you need to know. And so what he did, first of all, he, he writes about naming and he plays with it so that he talks to Dell as Dell Baby because he's playing with the conventions as my paper talked about playing with the conventions in naming. But then the rest of the story that's interesting for me is that apparently, this is my first semester in graduate school, right? And so it was a paper I turned in at the end of the semester. And so the, the paper comments came back from Goffman sometime during the next semester. Delheims apparently didn't know who I was because I was a first semester graduate student. He had a lot of students. He hadn't figured out who I was yet. And apparently he tried to give this letter to somebody else. She, like me, was female and had dark hair. That was all he needed. And so he tried to hand it to a friend of mine who told me about this. She thought it was very funny. That's the only way I knew about it. 
And she's and he said something about, oh, Wendy, here's your here's here's a letter about your paper. And she said something along the lines of, excuse me, I'm not Wendy. And he took back the letter. And the only way I got the letter is that another year later, I was his teaching assistant, Del Heim's teaching assistant. And the letter was on the top of top of his desk saying, give to Wendy. And so I went to him and I said, what is this letter from Irving Goffman about my paper? And he said, oh, yeah, I couldn't figure out which one you were. So I never gave it to you. So I, that was a very funny interaction. Um, the other interaction is that I was trying to track down Eviatar Zerubbabel's dissertation at a point when it was not available anywhere. It had apparently been done so recently that it was not available. But somebody, I don't remember who, had told me I needed to read it for a research project I was doing. And somebody told me to go ask Goffman. He would have it, of course, because he was the dissertation chair. And so I must have called the office. I probably reached somebody else. In short order, the dissertation was provided. I went and picked it up. He wasn't there. And my instructions were to put it through the mail slot at his home, which I did. But I always worried that when I pushed it through the mail slot, dissertation, it wasn't bound. It was, you know, a couple hundred separate pages with a rubber band. And I always worried about whether he came home to all the pages of that dissertation flying around the entrance instead of being attached in the rubber band. And I was never told otherwise. I was never able to find out what happened. So I did not meet him in person. I had these two rather odd interactions with him. I was the research assistant for the Center for Urban Ethnography under John Schwed. Um, and that was 78, 79. And so I have, I'm the person who put together all the documentation of what the center accomplished. So I actually have more documentation of what the center was doing. Somehow in all my moves, I never threw that out. I still had it. And so I was able to use all of that as a resource. But at that point, the center was no longer terribly active. It had done, it was a five-year grant. And so the grant was 1969. It actually started activities primarily in 1970, so till 75. And so in 78, 79, what we were doing was gathering together all the publications that had come out and doing a final report back to the National Institute of Mental Health in order to tell them what the center accomplished. So I have a very good sense of that because I'm the one who went running around the little room where the center was at that point no longer very active but had been based picking up, I was told to go around all the piles and document everything because nothing was in that room if it didn't relate to funding from the center. And so I was to go through all the shelves, all the piles and figure out what all the publications were and all the conference presentations and all of that. So that was an interesting thing to do. I also served as teaching assistant under Del Himes twice and a research assistant for Ginny Himes and I was a research assistant for Dan Benamos. So I had a number of things to do with some of the people. John Falk was on my dissertation committee. Heinz was on my dissertation committee. Schwed was on my dissertation committee and Ben Amos. So Schwed started out my chair. He went to Yale, couldn't keep him as chair when he went to Yale. So then it ended up being uh, Dan Ben Amos who chaired the, the dissertation in the final stages. So I had connections with many of these people. I took courses with most of them. The only one I never knew at all was uh, Saul Worth because he died in 1977 and I had only gotten there the second half of 75 and I had no chance to meet him. Uh -huh. But I knew Ray Bird was all quite well. We used to send him letters. When I did history of the discipline and documented the beginnings of intercultural communication in a couple of articles, he's the person who was there at all of the stuff that was going on and I was writing him you know, 10 and 20 page letters and would get back 10 and 20 page handwritten letters from my bird whistle. Um, wow. So I was, I was a very peripheral member of all of this, which is why I say it's an insider history instead of an outsider. History. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Fabulous. Fabulous. And, uh, you know, this, uh, in, in Brazil, 
this uh, research framework of uh, social linguistics or interaction of social linguistics, uh, they, they simply love uh, the text footing by Goffman. Goffman uh, footing is central for social linguistical <laughs> issues. <laughs> it, it's fabulous, it's fabulous because many people, uh, uh, the, this uh, chapter was published alone in a, a, a collected edition called Interactional Social Linguistics with text by Delheims, John Gumpert, and uh, Austin, and uh, and Goffman's footing, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, if, I think it's footing and the neglected situation. Yes, the neglected really situation. Different. This was something that came out of the night, the Berkeley cohort, and so it was part of. It was published in Gumpers and Himes' Directions in Sociolinguistics, um, and it was published before that. There was a version that was a special issue of. The Journal of American Anthropologist, and then it was published as a book. That was actually the reader that we used in Del Hines' ethnography communication. So that was one of the earliest things by Goffman that I read. When I told my father that I was reading Irving Goffman, and I wanted to talk about it. He said, "Did you never notice that I have an entire shelf of Goffman in my office?" And I said, "No, I never noticed. I, I was a, grow a kid growing up who, who went to look what nonfiction he was hoarding." That was never on my list. I had absolutely no idea. He was thrilled that I had finally discovered Goffman. I read my first Goffman uh, during a bus trip uh -huh. from uh, something like uh, 3,000 kilometers. I started on, I entered the bus, opened the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I closed the book and came at my place. I said, oh gosh, the presentation of self in everyday life. That was yes. a life-changing book. Yes. And my For very a first Goffman. I had some... Sorry, no, finish. No, I, I was some 20, 21. It was mm -hmm. mind-blowing <laughs> book. <laughs> it was un yes. unforgettable, unforgettable. Yes. My very first Goffman book was actually Frame Analysis because the university bookstore had it for a very cheap price for students in paperback. And so that was the very first thing that I ever read of this. And then in class, we read The Neglected Situation. So that was the second. And then I had to go back. And when I was home that year over semester break, I went to my father's bookshelf and I read the others. Because he really did have all of Goffman. It was astonishing. Yeah. I bought all the Goffman's books and uh, during my year in Manchester. Mm -hmm. Because well, Goffman had the, very uh, strong ties with Manchester. Yes, yes, and he was a professor there with uh, Max Gluckman. Yes. And there are several Goffman stories that take place in Manchester. Yes. These, uh, people like to cultivate these this old <laughs> stories, uh, telling about uh, fights in, in British pubs and things yeah. like this. <laughs> Eric yes, Dunning right. was had, uh, um, I, I studied there with Rod Watson. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. him. And Rod was my supervisor. There's a great friend of mine. He gave a lecture in this uh, Goffman yes. series uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, I was in the audience. I know that. Oh, right. And uh, we talked a lot about Goffman. I really knew Goffman in Manchester because mm -hmm. uh, I, I only have read the presentation of self and then uh, asylums and mm -hmm. uh, uh, stigma and that, that's all. But uh, when I was, I was there for a year and then I, used, I bought all the rest of the books. I bought it all <laughs> from Amazon and every week came a new Goffman. <laughs> <laughs> arrived by mail. Fantastic, fantastic. Yes. So, I think I was very lucky uh, to be I, I really in did. Pennsylvania because the, in the days before Amazon, I mean, this was the 1970s, so in the days before Amazon, you had to buy it from the books, from a physical bookstore. And because he yes. was one of the faculty authors, they would highlight his work at the bookstore. And so it was very easy to get all of his work there. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, you are in the, the right in the spot where everything happened <laughs> yes. in that uh, 
that if one can tell us about the, the Palo Alto group mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, on the West Coast, but there is uh, uh, this strong connection with Pennsylvania as well. They, they yes. kept going from here and there and changing positions. It's a bit the same with uh, ethnomethodology mm -hmm. and conversation analysis. That are yes. they are very in Brazil people that deal with government very often mm -hmm. do conversation analysis as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that and makes they sense. Like, yes, and they use government's concepts like face work mm -hmm. and uh, footing for uh, enhancing their their sequential analysis yes. uh, of uh, like the Harvey Sachs and the mm -hmm. Shegelov style. Yes. So they, they, they come very much together. There are some differences that can be discussed, but uh, they are very close. And in Brazil, mm -hmm. people use them very, they match them very well, uh, I think. Well, it, it makes perfect sense that Sachs and Shegelov were Goffman's students. And what's interesting is when you read the literature, people talk a lot about conflicts between them. But since I was just going through all sorts of old archival materials, I've discovered that when Sachs and Shegloff and Goffman were all part of a project that had nothing much to do with Penn, the mapping analysis project, multiple, excuse me, multiple analysis project, MAP, they were all together. They were a subset of the researchers who were doing other things. And that's a story that I'm going to have to now write up because I have a lot of materials that didn't really fit into this. And it wasn't really a group based at Penn, so it didn't make sense to include it here. But that was another group that he was part of. And Goffman and Sachs and Shagloff were accepted by all, and their letters are very friendly. They were accepted as doing very similar work. And so they were viewed as a, a little circle inside the bigger circle of researchers for that project. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, nowadays people uh, that do conversation analysis, they try to, to enhance their analysis by including what they call multimodality. Yes. That is, uh, uh, instead of only analyzing uh, the words that are said, they also analyze face expressions, hand expressions, and body uh, inclination and things like this. Uh, I would like to, uh, to ask you, <laughs> to hear you a bit about this. Uh, what would Bird Whistle think of this? Wouldn't this <laughs> well, bring uh, conversation analysis close to, to kinetics? Yes, well, you know that bird whistle was the reason that Goffman was willing to do so much with nonverbal behavior, and the reason that Hines changed the ethnography of speaking into the ethnography of communication. That was all bird whistles doing. So they were all working together on this stuff. So it's not really a question of what would bird whistle think now about conversation analysis becoming multimodal. That's what Bird Whistle thought he was trying to get people to do when he was working with the linguists in the 1950s. So this is really not something terribly new. This is what the Natural History of an Interview Project was all about in the 1950s. The whole goal was to bring together what people did with their bodies with what they did in terms of their words and how the interaction went. Now, the impetus for that was an interview by a psychiatrist, uh, but that Frieda from Reichman is the person who got all of that started. She could see that there were things happening when she worked with patients that were nonverbal, and she wanted the linguist and anthropologist who she met at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences in Palo Alto to study and explain to her and that's where the natural history of an interview came from. And so later projects, like the multiple analysis project, were one of the outcomes that came from the natural history of an interview. This was all what they were trying to get people to do back in the 1950s. It's just that it took a few years. People didn't immediately accept it. It's much more difficult to study nonverbal behavior. And instead of trying to work with regular film, now that we can so easily make videotapes and stop it and analyze it, 
life has gotten much simpler. I think this was a good case of where the technology had to catch up to the theory. I think people could not so easily have done the kind of multiple channel, multimodal analysis back in the 1950s. They were doing it, but very few. So Bird Whistle would be thrilled that everybody finally came around to his way of thinking. He, you know that he didn't just do kinesics, right? He was trained as an anthropologist. He had very strong training in linguistics. He worked with linguists. And it wasn't that he was saying only study what people do in terms of their bodies. He was saying, don't leave that out. And so I think he would be absolutely thrilled by multimodal analysis. I really do. I think he would see it as an obvious next step. Okay, uh, I'll just check here. Uh, I'll check the chat. Okay. All right. Plenty of compliments and uh, people enjoyed a lot your speech. I was checking the comments back on the on youtube and uh thank you a lot wendy uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here we are getting to our time here now and uh, this was the international seminar 100 years of irving goffman and uh, that's it <laughs> bye bye okay. bye bye thank you and i'm very sorry about the technology problem i caused at the beginning